David's on, but we still have ringy dingies. One ringy dingy, two ringy dingies. Hello, Your Honors. Hello, Your Influence. Can you take off on a tear? Because I need to. Uh, I just, I don't know if you picked up on the fact that I've been on the radio show for 10 or 12 minutes, but I was on a phone call that I, everyone heard my half of the conversation, and guess what, everybody in the uh, United States of America and many people around the world are going to hear about uh, what I was talking about in no uncertain terms in September of this year. So anyway, uh, the screw turns and uh, we're holding the screwdriver. Over to you, David. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Well, I believe we've got a significant breakthrough that might be tentatively described as a, a bait and switch by the Clinton parasitical psychopaths. And it dates back to October of 2000. So I'll give you the heading of today's post, which was ricocheted off your onion rotor mound, I believe. 2405, Clinton Navy's 8A breach, Marine Corps Arc of Treason, United Router, Onion Router Triggers for Serco Penren Coal. Penren is the Pentagon Renovation Project, which was being overseen, I believe, in the part that matters by John Bennett Ramsey before Clinton's goons, including your sister, arranged for the snuff film murder of John Bonnet Ramsey, uh, which so intimidated the father, he went on 18 months grieving leave, leaving the Pentagon renovation project open to the attack of 911. But I digress. One, in October 2000, former patent lawyer Hillary Clinton breached the Navy slash Marine Corps intranet, NMCI, by ordering former Secretary of the Navy, Gordon England, to outsource operations of patented devices on the largest internal network in the world to various SBA mentor companies and their 8A protégés. Now, you and I, Field, and the members of the network that have been following us for a while, know there was a rather critical conversation between a certain gentleman that relates to our first conversation and what you were reading at the time, and the secretary or former secretary of the Navy, Gordon England. Do you remember who Gordon England was talking to on 911? Over to you. Yeah, he was talking to Gerald DeCano. Uh, actually, he wasn't talking to Gerald DeCano. He was talking to some complicit insiders, but Gerald DeCano was trying to ring his number to get permission to launch defensive weapons from the Pentagon uh, and see, that's the problem with young guys, and no offense to Gerald DeCano or his family, but the idea would be, in my mind, to launch the weapons first and seek permission later. Uh, it's like if you're going to have a showdown on Main Street at high noon, uh, if you're shooting against Liberty Valance and John Wayne isn't there in the shadows with a long rifle, and you're a candy ass attorney uh, played by James Stewart, you better uh, not wait for 10 paces before you turn around and shoot the guilty bastard because you're a bad shot. So anyway, David, the phone call I just handled that caused a delay on our radio show was from an expert witness in an upcoming trial in Canton, South Dakota, which will have uh, national coverage. And it's also gonna be, uh, the trial is gonna be featured in a Hollywood documentary that is probably 90 to 95% complete they're just waiting on footage from Canton, uh, South Dakota, as I understand it. And a, the trial doesn't kick off till the day after Labor Day, the 8th of September of 2015. Uh, but I will entertain any guesses as to who I was just talking to on the phone for 20 minutes. And I will tell you that the Hollywood producer of the documentary film wants to talk to myself and Mad Dog. Uh, and the people, uh, Let's not be vague. G.H.W. Bush and Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton and Christine Marcy, if they think that they're going to get away with this, they are AFU, Alpha Foxtrot Uniform. And I can tell you, as her only sibling, I can guarantee you, my former sister, Christine Marcy, 
is totally AFU. And uh, she is a great embarrassment to myself, my parents, Glenn and Eileen McConnell, who are, uh, well, they're in heaven. Uh, if you don't believe me, look at John 14.2. I'll say that again, John 14.2. But their uh, remains are at Arlington, and I'll be in Arlington at some point uh, to lay a wreath, red, white, and blue wreath from, Google this, go ahead, I dare you. Sandy's, S-A-N-D-I apostrophe S, Sandy's Flower Shop, King George Street, Annapolis, Maryland, 21401. Would somebody go to Sandy's Flower Shop and uh, collect the web address? Uh, because Sa Sandy, oh, that, let me just, David, I know you have important things to say, but Ronnie and the Daytonas had a hauntingly beautiful song in 1965 that went something like this. Hey girl with sunlight in your hair, whoa, 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 it hurts me so to see you standing there, whoa, 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 whoa. come back Sandy. Anyway, that's running the Daytona Sandy, and Sandy's Flower Shop is where I buy the wreaths for my parents' grave because Sandy was a girl that knew both me and my parents uh, in the time frame 1963 to 19, well, the second of my parents died in 2008. So uh, Sandy, the owner of the flower shop, knows my parents very well. And um, I think that if you can take over, David, I'm going to go email Mad Dog and Dr. Man and put them in touch because the Hollywood producer that's finishing off a documentary film that is sufficient in quality to where it's appearing on all sorts of different channels, um, legitimate channels. Uh, these people like Jeb Bush <clears throat> and G.H.W. Bush, who authorized the murder of Colonel James Sabow, United States Marine Corps, uh, they probably didn't know who his phantom wingman was. David, over to you. Yeah, okay, thanks, Frank. So I'm going to go over this first paragraph and just explore some of the details. So October 2000, I think it was specifically the 5th of October in 2000, when some existing networks were brought together and outsourced to Serco and fellow mentor companies. And when you think of the strategic significance of outsourcing this information and data, <laughs> you realize that um, the United States Republic is on a death spiral if that is not stopped as quickly as possible. So about October the 5th, 2000, they outsourced the operation of patented devices on networks, as best I can judge, running fairly independently, the ones behind the Marine Corps intelligence activities, and the U.S. Navy Command Center, which was effectively based in the Pentagon under Wedge 1. And it was a subject, of course, of a Pentagon renovation project called Penrin. And, of course, with the treasonous Clintons in power in October of 2000, it should be no surprise that the prime contractor on the Penrin project, at least the the heart the, the, the buildings and furniture, etc., other than the information technology, was the British company, AMIC, which is a corrupt organization. It should have been treated as a RICO a long time ago, but it was reminded that the people upgrading the diesel systems in building number seven were also employed either through direct hiring by EMIC. And it is manifestly a major clue if the company that does the upgrades that get destroyed also get the contract to take the evidence away for what is known as spoliation. So EMIC, EMIC upgraded or commissioned the upgrade of the Pentagon renovation project in Wedge 1 on the morning of 
and then subsequently they got the contract to take the debris away and the body bits. Where did they take the debris and the body bits? Well, I don't know. We could look under garbage hills one and nine after there had been a change of use by the woman who is now the Attorney General. Black, of course, woman, of course. Loretta Lynch. So can I, David, can I use the term Loretta Lynch and Obama in the same uh, breath? For instance, if I were to say Lynch Obama, you'd know. Okay, so just taking a look at Loretta Lynch and her preparations for 911. Her brief uh, when she was, I think, Attorney General for, was it the Eastern District of New York? Yes, quite sure. Southeastern. Okay. She, around May of 2001, moved on to another job, I believe, in the private sector <coughs> after issuing a change of use decree for the. So it stopped being a dump for the Sanitation Department of New York and started being, initially presumably with a barbed wire fence around it, some of the, now, but just remind me, Phil, in one of our books, didn't you and Madame Scruffet or Mademoiselle Scruffet manage to get into that landfill? Over to you. Yes, we did. Oh, wait a minute, I'm accidentally calling someone named Mad Dog. Uh, I also accidentally called you, Dave, because I'm multitasking. But yeah, what we did was uh, I rode in a semi tractor trailer with an agent and a dog and the dog's name was Duke. He's a half German lights, uh, blinking purple lights on the front of a semi and some people in the United States and Canada and Western Europe know what blinking purple lights mean and some don't. But everyone in law enforcement knows what they mean. And so uh, we went up the I-95 corridor which goes from Washington DC to, to New York City and we parked the uh, now my phone's auto, my phone is auto calling people. I gotta call this. You stop the dog and the agent stayed in the truck with the uh, hazard lights flashing. Of course, not the purple lights anymore. Uh, and I went across the fence into uh, Fresh Kills One or Nine. You'd have to Google it. But if you want to find this, uh, I think it could be found easily. And I'm not going to do it because I don't want to screw up the bandwidth. And I'm screwing it up right now by emailing. But um, if someone were to Google Able Danger, well, let's go backwards. If they were to Google Chips plus Pastel plus IOC plus Duke plus Purple Lights plus Fresh Kills, I'm sure you'd find what we've written. And for all those people who send me questions, there are well-meaning people that ask me questions that we have answered, David and I, collectively in writing hundreds of times and years ago. Uh, if somebody has a specific question, you don't have to ask me because I might not have time to answer you. It, let's say you have a, a question about fresh kills. Just put in Chimish, H-A-M-I-S-H, plus fresh kills. Everything I've written will come up. David, over to you. I think you're absolutely right, Phil. But I, I get lots of questions, and I don't mean to be rude, but I think both you and I are flooded with a lot of inputs, we try and weave our way through to something that comes out in a meaningful uh, manner. So I often don't reply, and I think I use exactly the same logic. Uh, or more specifically, they can go to the Able Danger site under the search term and put in a couple of words associated with what they don't understand or don't appreciate or don't know about, and all of the links uh, to the articles or whatever that have been written about it will pop up, and then they can browse through it at their leisure. Yeah, so, go ahead. I feel the same way, and I don't blame them for contacting me because I want to be accessible. But uh, in fact, here's a compliment for most people that are within the sound of my voice. No, you were the only one. There was never a second choice, and I'll love you until I no longer have the will. If you're still within the sound, I don't have time to answer. Um, every person on the universe, there's seven billion people, a lot of them are coming awake and they have good questions. Uh, I got several questions overnight from people in Europe wanting to know how I knew that Malaysia 17 would go down on the 17th of 2014 prior to 7 p.m. 
it would have been a lot easier for them just to Google it. They could Google Field McConnell plus Malaysia 17 plus 1900 plus 17 July and hit enter and it all comes up. Uh, and see the beauty of Googling and the internet is long after I'm dead or in a doornail, I, uh, tracks will not. And David could slip on a banana peel tonight in his tub, except for I know he doesn't bathe because he thinks it's unmanly. And he has an allergy to potassium, so he's not going to have a banana peel. But anyway, if something happened to David or something happened to me or something happened to both of us, it doesn't matter. The show must go on. David, over to you. ...of the Navy military, um, Marine Corps intranet uh, and the service that people who get out of it, which must be incredibly frustrating. And I guess, I guess it's a bit like, you know, the um, the profile of the incumbent president of the United States, little Barry, uh, going to the phone, which I think Valerie Jarrett has taken off his desk and put in whatever the West Wing she infests, uh, so that she can get into it when she wants to. And she's put on his desk an Alcatel Lucent phone, which is not safe. And of course, when and if he does find where she's hidden the National Command Authority Defense Red Switch Network, the protocol is he picks it up and he pushes a number, which is what, the override or flash override or instant or priority, and then an agent will answer and say, yeah, what do you want? And little Barry says, well, I'd like to have a flash override signal to instruct my five-star and four-star generals that I want them all to stand down in Benghazi on September the 11th, uh, 2012. And uh, the guy at the other end, or gal, says, well, I guess that fits into our plans. We'll patch you through. Or if it doesn't fit into the plans, uh, then he is... Now, what did you use? What was the acronym? FUA? Phil? AFU. Oh, he's F A. He's AFU, right? Yeah. Who are we talking so, about? Little Barry. Oh yeah, he's AFU. He's also a queer in a three-dollar bill. He's also not black. He's a mulatto. He's also not an American. He's a Brit, uh, and he's also not untouchable. Whereas I am. And if you want to see it, it's written in Isaiah fifty-four seventeen which some lady from Brighton, England will be publishing. Her initials are AB, like Afterburner. And what I'm looking for is Isaiah 54, 17. And some guy, let's see if Jake's here. If Jake's not here, I'll pick on someone else who is here. Um, Jake, are you here? No, you're not. So let's just go ahead and see if Doug, what's his name is? No, no, not Doug, uh, George. Nope, George isn't here, so let's go back to Doug. Uh, Doug McNichols here, but right next to Doug is Doreen, and she'd probably rather do this. So uh, Psalm 91, 11 to 14, uh, that is where, in addition to Isaiah 54, 17, uh, Barry Swatero, Christine Marcy, Hillary Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, Jeb Bush, G.H.W. Bush, they all know they can line up and kiss my ass and they can't touch me. Over to you, David. Yeah, so... I just see a note about we can't afford another Bush economy. Well, I'll tell you what, America, I mean, if I may be so bold, you certainly can't afford Hillary Clinton's continued breach of the Navy Marine Corps intranet. Because what that means is she can outsource at will what is known as a remote or a online assassination betting network and take out any of her enemies wherever and whenever she wants. No, she can't. David, I'm her enemy. <laughs> I'm her enemy. I mean, I'm the guy who linked her to the QRS-11 and Christine Marcy. So that makes me that fat slob's enemy. And that fat slob who's got a, an ass the side of, size of Texas and knockers the size of peanuts, that fat slob cannot touch me. I defy her to try. I don't care how many dead bodies are in the wake of the Clintons, the Obamas, and the Bushes. You can't kill certain people. David, over to you. Yeah, and I think I take a riff on that, you see, Field, and I think I agree with you. 
maybe in a slightly more metaphysical sense, is that you are a virtual identity called chips. And your legacy, whether you're living or dead, is on the able danger network. And they can't put it back in the bottle. Now, when they engage in online or remote assassination betting, what do they think we're doing? We're engaged in online assassination betting, except we have better facts, more timely facts. They measure their facts in milliseconds, perhaps. I think we can say quite confidently we measure our facts in kiloseconds. That is to say, we, in a virtual space, can be at the crime scene where Captain Gerald de Conto was looking at the returns from the various radar signals that were looking at the skies above the Pentagon, and he realized that the aircraft, which had switched off their transponders, had a friendly identification systems on board, and the automatic firing systems of the missiles on the Pentagon roof were disabled. And, of course, he therefore called up Gordon England, who I think we have to accept now as a traitor or a fool, doesn't really matter which, particularly when you come to wrongful death suits, asking permission to re-engage the firing batteries on the roof of the Pentagon. And what this scumbag did, Gordon England, and why hasn't he been in court to explain exactly what was said to Captain Gerald de Conto, or um, Fish as he was known, uh, he stalled. And he used the delays inherent in the Navy military, sorry, the Navy Marine Corps intranet system and handed control over to the woman who was running the racketeering accelerated loan program for the small business administration mentor companies and their 8A protégés, including Base One Technologies, uh, New Rochelle, in Westchester County, etc. So who was the woman, Field? I never hear of you saying this. Was in charge of the accelerated loan program for the Small Business Administration. On what on day? Which day? On 911. So leading up to 911, who is the... Yeah, on, on the day itself. Well, would her initials be KM? Absolutely. Is she a radical militant lesbian? And I believe a pedophile. Sure, she's a pedophile. She runs the biggest net centric pedophile organization in the world, and they operate a bunch of uh, places that are, or they're actually their stock. It's a way of stockpiling uh, pedophile targets. They get orphans, and if they can't find orphans, they'll create orphans by starting wars for the benefit of Circo and NATO. And uh, let's just call an ace an ace and a bunch of spades a bunch of spades. Uh, people like General Dempsey, uh, General Odierno, uh, General Dunford, the, uh, the clock is ticking on him. Um, you and I, David, are going to send a very brief letter to Dunford uh, laying out the landscape. And he can do one of two things. He can join us or he can hang. Is that clear enough, David? Yeah, absolutely. I'm... And I'm getting a little irate. And, no, don't uh, get irate. No, 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 no. Calm down. Don't get irate. Don't get your panties in a bunch. Just stay calm, and we will get these bastards. But we have to wait on God's timing, period. Over to you. Okay, I accept your input there. So I put up an image in the chat room, and it's a fascinating image. It's described at the top as the arc of instability. And when putting this post together from the ricocheting information coming through your mound, I was toying the idea with the idea field of calling it the arc de trahison or trahison. Now, do you know why I was toying with the idea? I decided to keep it simple. But why do you think I was thinking about calling it the arc de trahison? Over to you. Because the arc of instability would not be French. You're absolutely right. That's so why I'm here, tries. David. David, it's my job yeah. to be absolutely right. And the reason absolutely. I can be absolutely right is because I don't get my panties in a bunch. Yeah, absolutely. You're welcome. Well, thank you, Phil. Over to you. Yeah.
So trahison is the French word for treason, and de is the French word for of. And uh, if I describe the arc of instability introduced as a strategic concept by planners at the Marine Corps intelligence activity and think about instead describing it as the Arc de Trahison, I'm thinking specifically about Francophones uh, with members of or associates of the organization known as the French American Foundation. And the organization known as the French American Foundation did something rather weird in the late 90s. It decided in its wisdom to convene defense symposia for leading military personnel in the United States and leading military personnel in France. And I wonder, of course, if those defense symposia, most of them held in the United States, I believe, in Virginia, and the ones in France held, I believe, in Paris, if there were state secrets transferred from American military to the French military or vice versa, because the proper remedy for that would be to, for example, I believe a Marine general like uh, former Marine general James Jones to instruct a, when a would it be a posse of Marines? What, what is a, the generic term for a collection of Marines field over to you. Badass motherfuckers. Excellent. That General Jones would organize a posse of badass motherfuckers, being Marines or ex Marines, and go to the law office where these useless, pathetic, amateurish scumbags were convening and chattering away in French about the secrets that would ordinarily have prevented the United States from anticipating and uh, killing the people who were organizing the attack of 911. But they didn't. They conspired to stand down the defenses of the United States. And the man who conspired the most, uh, who was in a position of authority, I presume. Now, is a Marine general automatically a four-star general field? Over to you. No, uh, the ranks for officers in the Marine Corps, not including warrant officers, start with second lieutenant, which is 01, first lieutenant, 02, captain, 03. In fact, here's a picture of a captain uniform right there. Uh, anyway, and that's the captain that's going to beat uh, Barry Swatero, Christine Marcy, and the rest of these shitheads. Uh, but anyway, uh, Major 04, uh, Lieutenant Colonel 05, Colonel 06, like Jimmy Sabau, uh, and Jimmy Sabau, Sabau may be dead, uh, but he's in heaven, of course, because he was a believing Catholic Christian, um, and that's written in John 14, too. Uh, but anyway, J, uh, James Sabau is going to be vindicated, and I know that because I'm one of the three vindicators, and uh, when I vindicate, it sticks. Okay, uh, Brigadier General is one star, that's 07. Major General is two stars, that's uh, 08. And there's a two-star general named Smedley Darlington Butler, who in 1937 said war is a rocket. And he was right, so what the hell's taken the rest of these Marines so long to catch on? But anyway, Lieutenant General, like Field Harris, who I was named after, and he's a traitor, by the way, um, his, uh, that rank is 09, Lieutenant General is three stars, 09, like Field Harris, Annapolis 17, traitor. Uh, how do we know he's a traitor? Well, because he's got an OBE, that means Order of the British Empire, which means he was sucking on the Queen's tent or the King's whatever. Uh, in other words, he's a traitor, and I don't like traitors. I don't like them if, they're, if I'm named after them or if they're my sister. A traitor is a traitor, and to me, they're all pussheads. A uh, general with four stars is called general, just straight general, no other thing. But it's O10, and that's the highest rank in the Marine Corps ever held. Uh, if the United States uh, wishes to get this thing straightened out uh, as quickly as possible, they do have the option of uh, creating a O11, which would be a five-star Marine general, which would immediately put the individual 
that would have the five stars in charge of the entire Department of Defense Fighting Force, which is sold out to NATO right now. Uh, and in fact, NATO uh, is up against the EU, and the EU is effectively France and Germany. And uh, the EU and NATO uh, might find themselves... In fact, David, I've got a wonderful video I'll put on Wednesday's show. It is a well-known uh, presidential limousine pulling up to a gathering in Ada, ADA, Minnesota, yesterday at about uh, 1 p.m., so that's 25 hours ago, a black limousine uh, pulled up and a delegate delegation of four Chinese people got out of the limousine uh, and somebody you know is driving the car, David. I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, yeah, thanks, Phil. And so I'm just looking at this arc of instability or arc de trahison, whatever you like to call it. And there's the logo over the left-hand side, which is MCIA, Marine Corps Intelligence Activity, which is the intelligence arm of the Marine Corps, which filters information from different parts of the world, but especially the arc of instability, and presumably identifies parties that represent the threat to the United States of America in general, and the Marines in particular, including this clown who shot the four Marines a few days ago. So if we are cynical and stand the logic on its head, if the Marine Corps intelligence activity has been infiltrated by Clinton's and your sister's uh, 8A protege companies, that would represent companies owned by, I don't know, first generation aliens from China or Vietnam, which of course, I don't know the exact mix, uh, when the Europeans fetched up in uh, Vietnam, they ended up primarily speaking French. So the La Francophonie countries would include Vietnam. So if you wanted to recruit someone to look as though they represented a threat to the United States and set up what I believe is called a honeypot. If you do it uh, with a little bit of uh, smarts, you can bring in the legitimate servants of the United States to track the people who are presenting themselves as a threat. And that was a basic scam introduced by your sister. Now, I, I hesitate to give her any credit for intelligence. My instincts tell me that she still has just adopted a gig that was developed many, many years before by really smart people in British intelligence. And I don't think that's quite such a big as an oxymoron as assigning any intelligence to your sister or even the Marine Corps intelligence activity if they've unwittingly been subverted. So which 8A company, in the greater scheme of things, was set up by the Department of State in 1994 to operate what are known as honeypots. That is to say, you stage the honeypot on a server remote from the one inside the Department of State in Washington. You operate it as a private honeypot and you start looking for the good folks who are trying to peck America by creating a storyline or a script of bad folks wanting to attack America. Well, that 8A company is none other than an outfit called Base One Technologies at New Rochelle in Westchester County, about 20 minutes up the road from where the Clintons hang their hats when they're not buggering little children, or vice versa. So 20 minutes away from the Clinton home in Chappaqua, Westchester County, New York, which they bought in 1998, which is the year when these patented devices were outsourced to the mentor protege companies, you've got this fascinating baptism for the infiltration of the Navy Marine Corps intranet which is the bombing attack of the USS Cole. And David, why did they need to buy a house in New York? You know, 
What's that? I don't know. I do because she's a carpetbagger from Illinois and he's a piece of garbage from Arkansas and they needed to uh, infest New York because there was a judge uh, up there whose name I believe is Michael B. Mukasey and he is in the southeast district of New York and he could be counted on, being Jewish of course, he could be counted on to uh, try to suppress the truth of the upcoming 9-11 attack which Christine Marcy and Hillary Clinton were well aware of since they were principals in the architecture of the attack which included droned aircraft and how do I know this? Because my sister got the information from me. Now how is any court in the land other than Mukasey or James Comey or the jerk that uh, took over from Mukasey, uh, he immediately got bounced because they set him up in a honeypot deal. I forgot his name but he's a Republican uh, was a, the governor and he got uh, neutered or removed from office because they set him up with a prostitute um, and uh, you know fortunately for him it was a heterosexual female prostitute whereas most of the Obama type entrapments would be male on male uh, prostitutes uh, for instance Judah. well uh, Alex O'Krent that's a-L-E-X, uh, O-K-R-E-M-T, plus Larry uh, Bland, plus Nate Spencer, plus Donald Young. Uh, Tail Gunner Barry, if he was going to set somebody up, he would probably assume that everybody's as queer as he is and probably set up a honeypot with a tail gunner. And not all of us are queer like him. And I want to go on record as saying that I'm an uh, overt CMAO heterosexual sexagenarium. Stick that in your pipe, Sotero. Over to you, David. Yeah, and of course, uh, little Barry Sotero, through no fault of his own, became a child prostitute at seven years old when he was groomed by a cross-dressing male prostitute called Turdy. I don't think that's in dispute, is it, Phil? No, and I think Turdy and Pardo, and of course Pardo was uh, Mitt Romney's male lover in the summer of 68 when he was over there uh, killing off people in a Citron. Uh, anybody want to find a picture of a Citron that killed a woman? And uh, it's night, in July of 68, I believe. It was somewhere near Paris. It was a Citron. It had a head-on collision. Uh, Mitt Romney was driving it. A woman was killed and there was a priest in the car. And I don't know about his gay lover, Pardo, but I bet you Pardo was required to wear mantel pants. Over to you, David. Yeah, and of course, they're a little careless because uh, yours truly was um, indirectly connected to a surveillance operation in Paris in 1968 and watched the agent provocateurs swing into action to try and uh, th overthrow the government or the Fifth Republic of Charles de Gaulle. But that was an entirely um, uh, manipulated attack on the established government of France that provokes the kind of reaction we get today. You know, when the four uh, Marines get shot, let's tighten up on security, when in fact the attacks are coming from within the arc of instability. Now, <clears throat> looking at this map, I don't think it looks particularly like, like an arc, but uh, be that as it may, as far as I can judge, and my geography is not too hot, or perhaps you've flown over a lot of this stuff, you can help me, would I be right in saying that the entire proposed flight of MH Flight 370 is within the footprint of this arc of instability field. Over to you. Well, I don't know because I don't have the arc of instability up in front of me right now, but uh, the, the, the alleged flight of Malaysia 17, which was really the aircraft of Malaysia 370, I've got some information. There it is. Thank you. Uh, no, the flight as far as instability goes, Malaysia 370 might be in that arc, but Malaysia 17 was north of that arc. Which one are you talking about, David? 17 or 370? 370. Oh, okay. Yeah, it started down the southeast corner at Kuala Lumpur. It initially took off uh, on the northwest runway at Kuala Lumpur. It made a right turn at 1,500 feet as the flap and slats were retracted and it turned to about 055 degree heading to pick up the 025 degree radial to BITOD intersection, which is in the cone of confusion between Singapore, Vietnamese, and Malaysian airspace. And right there in the cone of confusion, Circle uh, took control of the aircraft through the BUAP and turned it back 
on a southwest vector, which uh, made it threaten the Malaysian uh, the Malaysian Peninsula, and, and nobody knew why it was going that direction, and so some. Uh, rogue elements of the United States Air Force in UCLA 27, Y-U-K-L-A 27. Would somebody, I mean, I, I don't want to sound like a dictator or a lazy bastard, although I am sort of tired, but if somebody could Google UCLA, Y-U-K-L-A 27 plus MH370 plus B-I-T-O-D plus Kuala Lumpur, I think something would come up, and uh, I'm not going to use bandwidth, that's why I'm asking someone else to do it, but UCLA, Y-U-K-L-A, 27, that's a military call sign, uh, plus B-I-T-O-D, that's an intersection in the cone of confusion, plus MH370, that's the aircraft that was never lost, uh, anybody with any amount of understanding knows exactly where it went, how it got there. Um, who has understanding? Well, the United States Air Force, the United States Navy, uh, Serco, uh, Rolls-Royce, the engines on there, Rolls-Royce Trents, and they ping, and they uh, every so often uh, they update where they're at, and so everybody at Rolls-Royce knows exactly where Malaysia 370 went, and speaking of Rolls-Royce, now they've got control of all the U.S. Air Force C-130s, that have the six bladed props and the Rolls Royce engines, which is not a very good idea because all those engines can be shut down by FADEC, and Rolls Royce knows that, so do I. David, over to you. Yes, I've got a picture uh, up in the chat room of uh, these cats flying around in Marine One. And over on the left at the top, you see General Jones, a Marine General. Uh, James Jones, and at the time he's flying this, of course, I think he's security advisor to the White House under Jug Ears on the left-hand side, you know, the Mulatto. Yeah. And over on the right, we've got um, the former patent lawyer, Hillary Clinton. Now, let's see if I can get this right. I apologize if it's complicated and... Uh, it doesn't come out right. What Hillary Clinton did as a patent lawyer, as you pointed out, I think earlier, she brokered the development of the QRS-11, quartz rate sensor 11 gyro chip, into the triaxial gyroscope or flight box used on the planes hijacked on 911. She then swans off to New York, and she's in 1998. She uh, buys the home in Chappaqua. And when I say she, People should understand that Bill Clinton never ran the White House. He doesn't have the moral courage to do the right thing, and he's not persuasive enough or scary enough inside the White House to get otherwise loyal servants of America to keep stum about the corruption in the White House, which, of course, is not just limited to condoms on the Christmas tree. It's much deeper than that. Hillary ran the White House from the time she got in and formed that uh, Base One Technologies woman-owned 8A companies as a front for the Department of State to engage in remote assassination betting, of which the Rwanda genocide would be a classic example. Anyway, back to Hillary Clinton role as a patent lawyer inside the White House. And first of all, you have to address the question that no doubt some Americans will ask, well, she was a patent lawyer, and she's not a patent lawyer anymore. But of course, once a patent lawyer, you're always a patent lawyer. That is to say, you understand the process of patents and how they be, can be corrupted. For example, someone comes up with a bright idea like an onion router, and you say to them, we'd like you to assign that patent to us, in which case the owner or the person who's been assigned the patent says get lost, in which case you kill them. Where have we seen the classic example of that? Um, what's the name of the fella in the 101st floor of building one on 911 who invented a carbon dioxide trading 
system. You mean Carlton Bartels? Yeah, absolutely. How come I have to uh, do all the how come I have to do all the thinking around here? Well, he went up to I don't know because my brain gets a little bit tired, Phil. And yours still seems fairly fresh. But uh, poor old Bart Carlton Bartels, he had a patent that these scumbags wanted to take control of. And they invited him up to Calgary for a CO2E.com symposium the week before for an exercise in trading carbon credits. And they presumably told him, uh, we want your patent. He told them to get lost. I'm sure he's a very nice guy. Uh, so he was sent back to New York to the 101st floor of building number one to engage in a simulated trading in carbon credits financed by these scuzzy banks that your sister put together for the Small Business Administration, including, of course, HSBC. And so they tracked him. Now, this wasn't in the ARC, the Trezor, but he was tracked from by French speakers in the French-American Foundation while he was playing the game. So they knew what computer he was playing it at. And they used that computer to provide the precise geospatial coordinates for the camera crew outside with the Duane Street Ladder Company. Duane Street, D-U-A-N-E. And S-T. Yeah, Street. And that turns out, yeah, to be an acronym for no day. So these people, you think, they think they're very smart, Bill, but they're dealing with some lethal brains, not just yours and mine, but the collective wisdom of able danger. And sometimes I feel sorry for them. They're not equipped with the ability to turn on a dime or fly towards a target at a closing speed of 4,000 miles an hour. I think that's a, is that a pretty fair guess of what you used to do? It's very close. It's close enough that they don't know uh, what side of course it's on. And if they want to find out, they can just go ahead and subpoena me into a court. But of course, if anybody gets me into a court, hang on, I'm going to cough. <clears throat> they also bring in uh, 90,000 pages of posts that you and I have written. And they bring in 14 and a half books, or is it 15 and a half? I guess they'd have to gamble on that. And they also bring in 470 radio shows. And they also bring in uh, God, and I don't know which they're most afraid of, but I presume it's the last one. David, over to you. Okay, thanks. Now, who, what's that logo or insignia above the head of James Jones? Over to you. I don't see James Jones, but let me go back. Is the picture in the helicopter? Yeah. Um, oh, I, I can't. I somebody, picture. let me see if I can blow up that picture, which I think I can. I just blew it up. Let's see if I can read it. Uh, it says President of the United States, and of course, in his case, that would be posing resident, not president, because he's posing as a resident, and he is a resident of 1600, but he's not a president. Uh, he's a absolute POS, and uh, these people that support him, James Jones, of course, I sat next to his niece on a flight from Minneapolis to Dallas, and she told me he's a P that he, James Jones, uh, is also a POS. We know Hillary's a POS with a with a broad ass and a flat chest. Uh, the poor guy in the middle, the Secretary of Defense, decided he didn't want to hang around with these goofballs much longer, so he bailed out. And now we got a guy who's the Secretary of Defense who looks like a babbling idiot. Uh, and I think people refer to him as not Ashton Carter, but Aston Carter because all he can do is stutter. He can't form a thought. He is not a leader. He has no military background. If I had to pin a tail on that donkey, I'd say shithead. Over to you, David. Yeah, and uh, just thinking on the fly, I think Joseph Dunford, if he doesn't act on what you're sending him, you're the only candidate for that position, and you have to be upgraded to five-star, because you've got to Clean out. Did I ever teach you what the job of was the, the main cleaner of the orgy and stables, Phil? Uh, the main cleaner of the who stables? Orgian or Orgian. I'm not quite sure whether it's a hard or a soft G. It probably wouldn't matter to you. 
No, I don't know. But in our chat room right now, we have someone who has a relationship with royals and horses in England. And he may or may not, or she may or may not, be known as Agent McDime. Uh, but I could find out for you. But go ahead and tell the chat room before I try to find out. Well, apparently there was a lot of shit left around the organ and stables, and so they had to employ someone to clean it. And I think the amount of shit in or buried within or concealed within the Navy Marine Corps um, intranet is actually huge. But the intriguing thing is the man-in-the-middle attack that can be launched through that vast network, the largest network, internal network in the world, can be very simply done by you and your marine colleagues, retired marine colleagues, provided you get the letter of mark and reprisal from Congress, uh, you can just pop in and say you are taking custody. You don't physically have to carry them out of the network or take them out of the network. Of all patented onion router devices that have been used since the patent application was filed by Hillary Clinton in 1998 on behalf of the Secretary of the Navy, Gordon England. Now, isn't that fascinating that this is a patent or the patented devices that were already in use by the United States Navy that protected their privileged communications between naval assets around the world that prevented eavesdropping, a perfectly legitimate and very clever piece of technology that would have rendered back then in 1998 the United States Navy more or less impervious to eavesdropping. And with, of course, the US, US Navy hooked through to the Marine Corps, that would mean an operation in let's say Malaysia or Indonesia or Vietnam by the Marine Corps Expeditionary Force could not be intercepted or not easily intercepted or monitored. So this parasitical pedophile psychopath Hillary Clinton realized that she had to change the ground rules relating to patents. Now, the Crown Rights Rules, as I understand them, and I have filed for a patent in my own name a long time ago for the object-oriented fractal paintbrush, and that's irrelevant, except I spent probably £20,000 that I could barely afford going through the motions and then ran out of money, so my patent, having got through to the first stage of the European Patent Office, became what is known as a stranded patent. And my best judgment of what happened to that is it became the property of the crown by default, which pisses me off. But don't get mad, don't get even, I think is your words for you. No, don't get mad, uh, get even. Yes, okay. So now the United States Navy research labs invented this patent. They had spread it throughout the Navy, I believe, by 1996. But Hillary Clinton and your sister realized <clears throat> that there would be very little chance of getting or tricking the United States Navy into the honeypot if communications between the ships were eavesdrop-proof or nearly eavesdrop-proof. So they did something quite ingenious. Again, they must have been told to because they don't have the wits to do this. Under Crown Rights Rules, the Crown has the right to practice any patent it issues. That doesn't apply in the United States of America, or didn't, until 1998, when the former patent lawyer, Hillary Clinton, evidently sat down with the former Secretary of the Navy, Gordon England, and said, hey, we've got to stop these guys, or the people in the United States Navy or the Marine Corps, because they are in a position to prevent us from eavesdropping their strategy for defending America in the uh, planned attack on 911. So Gordon England, who might not be the sharpest knife in the drawer, he's said, not. well, Henry, what are you, go ahead. No, he's not, because, you know, he was one of the four people that participated and authorized the scuttling of the USS America 
And I just happen to be wearing a USS America cap right now, David. Do you remember any of the other people? There were four people that signed off on the scuttling of the USS America. It was uh, approved in 1996 by Gordon England and two people who you may remember and one that you certainly won't remember. Can you remember either one of the two? No, sir. Okay. Who was Bill Clinton's uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs? Shelly Cashfully. Yeah. Shelly Cashfully, Bill Clinton redacted and Gordon England signed off on the scuttling of the USS America and that was a brazen uh, indication of what they were going to participate in next which was the decapitation of the United States of America because they knew in 96 that as soon as they got out of office meeting the Clintons uh, they would allow George Bush to look like the dope uh, when a bunch of uh, Muslim patsies were given a bunch of money to walk through cameras making it look like they boarded aircraft on the morning of 9-11 uh, and then they would turn left, exit stage left and they would go back to where they came from and live the life of Riley uh, while uh, technology that my sister and Hillary ripped off from me gee, that's a unique boast it's not a boast, it's a statement of fact, but there's nobody else in the world, David, that can say that Hillary Clinton and Christine Marcy ripped off my intellectual property because there's no one else in the world that is unfortunately the sibling of Christine Marcy, one of the most evil and uh, vaginosis inflicted lesbians that has ever been a traitor to the United States of America, uh, the country that myself, my father, and my mother all served. And if they want to get the last standing McConnell uh, you can probably find me at Arlington Cemetery and uh, somebody has been posting a picture of the flight track of the aircraft that uh, struck the Pentagon and in that photo uh, the grass to the left of that photo, or excuse me, the grass on the left side of the photo and to the left of the Pentagon looking north, northeast, off to the left is a bunch of grass and that's the green, green grass of my parents' last home. David, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Phil. And so you got after B putting up a picture of this jerk, Gordon England, who should have been in court, and explained precisely to the court what conversation he had with Captain Gerald DeConto and why he stalled the poor man and prevented him from overriding the stand-down commands that were being sent through the onion router to the missile battery on the roof. And he didn't. So at the very least, he can be charged with the wrongful death of Captain Gerald de Conto. At the very most, he should swing on the gallows. My preference at the moment is he swings on the gallows, but not before he's been waterboarded to get every bit of information he knows about that conversation that he must have had with the patent lawyer or former patent lawyer, Hillary Clinton, back on the 5th of October of 2000. So Hillary would have said to him, maybe she didn't want to take, talk patent law to this, uh, this clown, uh, or she basically conveyed to him a solution to the problem that the U.S. Navy had an eavesdrop proof communication system embedded in the United States Navy Marine Corps intranet, the biggest in the world, or about to become, by integration, the biggest in the world. And the, and the solution that was discovered by Clinton, or communicated to Clinton, was, well, under Crown rules, or Crown rights rules, the Crown has the right to operate or practice every patent issued to a private company. So with a little bit of bait and switch, I think that's the right term, Hillary was told, why don't you introduce a new form of patent law into the United States of America, where any company, mentor company or protege company, under the Small Business Administration operated by Phil's sister since 1998, uh, any patent granted to them gives them the grant, gives them the right to operate any patents issued or assigned to the United States government. And suddenly you get an extraordinarily powerful, what do I call it? Maybe I call it what the virtual floating matrix, which is a term introduced by the RCMP. You now have the crown in the United Kingdom, 
the presidential office of the United States of America acting as a proxy for the Crown of England and the Small Business Administration mentor companies and their thousands and thousands and thousands of 8A companies owned by Chinese nationals, Vietnamese nationals, Francophone nationals, lesbians, gay, bisexual, trans transgendered, black, Hispanic, anything. But whatever looks like um, Phil Bacon or his female equivalent. Loosely, perhaps you could describe them as heterosexual Caucasians. Now, that's quite a formidable enemy, which is about to be dismantled or neutered, I think is the right word. That is to say, the Crown agents, which hang out in Washington, dating back to, I think, the 1960s, prior to the assassination of JFK, corrupt elements within the presidential office of the United States of America, the major defense contractors, such as Boeing, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, etc., etc., and the 8A companies, which have been going since the 1950s, all bound together in a network they think is safe, albeit it's agonizingly slow, and embedded within that, is the patented onion router network, which gives them instant access to weapons at the crime scene. So, of course, if you were engaging in remote or online assassination betting, you can watch the bets as they come in at the different predicted times of death of, let's say, Captain Gerald DeConto or Captain Chick Burlingham or uh, is it Colonel Sabau? Yeah. yeah, Colonel James E. Sabau, United States Marine Corps. Anybody who doesn't recognize the name of Colonel James Sabow, S-A-B-O-W, U-S-M-C, uh, I recommend you Google Colonel James Sabow plus Jeb Bush plus G-H-W-B plus murder. Over to you, David. Yeah, I just see that swamp put um, other people's money, which is an interesting, you turn that into an acronym and that becomes the Office of Personal Management, which was run by your sister as assistant director in, uh, in the 1970s. And my understanding is feel that America as a country has been breached through the Office of Personal Management and up to the files of up to 32 million Americans have been transferred out of the Office of Personal Management to parties unknown. Hey, David, I you, think there is a, go ahead. you know that Sherlockian quote, you see but you don't observe? Yeah. Take another look at that uh, image of Obama with other people's money and see if you can figure out what the message is. It's not Office of Personal Management, even though they're linked. Do you know what the message is? Is there a code on the side of his pipe? No, but just go ahead and uh, using phonetics, uh, just if you were to create a word out of OPM and no other letters, how, what would that word sound like? Obama. No, opium. Ah. Opium is other people's money. And that's what Obama has been doing. That's what David Cameron, sissy number two, has been doing. That's what Stephen Harper, sissy number one, has been doing. They've been uh, pretending like the 10 year plus war in Afghanistan for which uh, 38 men and a dog named Bart gave their lives. Uh, Obama and Cameron and Harper are a bunch of Zionist queers uh, that have put United States military men at risk and women. Uh, and the risk to the military men and women has not been handled well by Martin Dempsey uh, who is a hyphenated American with a bad complexion, and he's also a Knight of Malta. And uh, if Joe Dunford doesn't get his shit together, you know, he's going to get a serving of this also. David, over to you. Uh, right, Phil. So the intriguing thing here with that virtual floating matrix, you've got a historical matrix, which is the crown has the right to use or practice patents issued 
to any party within the realm, so to speak, which of course stretched around the world at one time, still does of course. And you've got Clinton, the patent lawyer, who introduced uh, a bait and switch derivative of that, where these mentor companies such as Serco and uh, 8A Protege companies get the right to use or practice any patent issued to the Crown or its proxies, which is the United States Republic of America. <clears throat> so on 1911, or let's say is the coal is uh, steaming, past able, it gets a message over the Navy Marine Corps intranet about five days after it was launched by Gordon England and Hillary Clinton and Christine Marcy with an instruction, remember the onion router is perfectly synchronized with the clock operated by Circo since 1994 or perhaps 1993 under a privilege extended by David Cameron and his chancellor Norman Lamont, who's a former Rothschild banker. And we have colleagues, I know, Phil, that really would love us to single out Rothschild and bring him to book, except it's difficult with the Rothschild because they are the ultimate virtual floating matrix. So they're buried so deep within the system. We've got to peel off the various layers. So the onion router is quite a good metaphor. But anyway, I digress. But just remember, N.M. Rothschild is the investment bank of Circo, and uh, HSBC, the world's leading drug hub money laundering bank, is the operational bank for Circo's cash transactions and money laundering. So you've got, as the uh, USS Cole steams along the coast of Aden, where it is normally refueled under that acronym I'm always forgetting. What is it? Which acronym? When you refuel at sea. Oh, it's, a under, it's an UNREP, U-N-R-E-P, Underway Replenishment. Okay, so with the protocol prevailing at the time and the Marine Corps intelligence activity indicating that uh, the Aden Harbour was unsafe to go into. They overrode the Navy Marine Corps intranet with onion router signals that hacked into the bridge of the USS Cole so that the senior officer on the bridge received a command to go into Aden Harbour and refuel at the dock. And they would have had to have a reasonably persuasive evidence that the government of Aden had approved the docking of an American warship in the harbor. But that's easy if you control the 8A company, Base One Technologies, which is just up the road from the Clinton house or Maison, particularly when Base One Technologies is a protege company of circuit because Base One Technologies has been in the business since the 14th of February 1994 of setting up honeypots to entrap white hats, that is the good folks who have sworn to uphold the oath, the constitution, and protect America against enemies both domestic and foreign. So James Jones, the Marine Corps Commandant, Hillary Clinton, the First Lady, and Christine Marcy, the Chief Operating Officer of the Small Business Administration, would have known who all the white cats, who all the white hats were in the vicinity <coughs> of the U.S. coal as it went into Aden Harbour, and who the white hats on land were. Unfortunately for America, they would also know the black hats. And equipped with the onion router, they could synchronize the movements of the black hats to eliminate a significant number of white hats and intimidate the folks back home. So the USS Cole gets the command to go and refuel in Aden Harbor, actually to dock. It actually fetches up against a bumper on the dock where my 
relative expertise as an explosive saboteur, perhaps the wrong word, is that there were explosives in the bumper against which the USS Cold Dock. Now they made maybe a two to three meter error, which is not bad in the greater scheme of things, in docking the USS Cole, because what they really wanted, and I'll come back, James Jones and Hillary Clinton and Christine Marcy and Gordon England, is to place or align the ship's magazine with explosives in the bumper so that when the detonation signal was relayed over the onion router embedded in the United States Navy Marine Corps intranet, the ship would have been blown into a million pieces. And they would have succeeded in humiliating America and destroying the most advanced frigate in the United States Navy and generally testing out the ability to engage in a man in the middle attack, or dare I say it, a woman in the middle attack, on the world's most powerful military organization. Anyway, they made a pretty impressive display, caused the wrongful death, I forget how many people were murdered on the USS Cole, and then they hired a, I think, a Danish uh, heavy lift vessel to pick the friggin' USS Cole up and put it on the deck and go back to a repair job with a gash in the side of the most advanced frigate in the United States Navy, which of course is another attempt to humiliate America. And why did they, David, why did they pick the USS Cole? Um, well, I think they wanted to send a signal to someone who has a son called Cole. Do you think that makes sense? Yeah, and my son Cole and my four daughters and I were at a wedding in Ada, ADA, Minnesota, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and it was a, a delightful 48 hours away from this crap that we're engaged in. But, of course, we have to stay engaged until we're given victory. And when we're given victory, it won't be because of human effort, although our human effort has been uh, consistent and significant. Uh, but the people that we are wrestling against are servants of Satan. And if anybody wants to see that in writing, just put in Shinseki, S-H-I-N-S-E-K-I, -S plus Sotero, S-O-E-T-O-R-O, plus Satan, S-A-T-A-N, plus Soames, S-O-A-M-E-S, plus Circo, S-E-R-C-O. And what we're engaged in here is trying to, um, and I don't think you understand this yet, David, or don't believe it if you do understand it, but the Fourth Reich um, is alive and well, and they're the ones that are deploying some of these perverts uh, like Obama, Harper, John Kerry, the Khazar, K-H-A-Z-A-R, uh, McCain, uh, the traitor, Christine Marcy, uh, the flatulent, and Hillary Clinton, the flat-breasted, and Bill Clinton, the gadget bent. Uh, all these despicable failures are working for Satan and loosely assembled under the Vatican, the Crown, and NATO they're working for what I would characterize as the Fourth Reich. And let's not waste time discussing that, David. I'll put that in Wednesday's show and I'll flush it out between now and then. Over to you. Yeah, okay, thanks, Phil. And as you know, I'm very comfortable with the weapon and opportunity uh, first and second, and then leave the motivation, the mens rea, to a jury as a technical guy. So what intrigues me here, this matrix where the SBA's mentor companies and their 8A protégés, I don't think Americans really understand how extensive and powerful this is. When your sister in January of 2001 boasted about how she'd accelerated the loan guarantee program for the Small Business Administration to under 60 minutes, Effectively, what that means is the 50 to $70 billion loan portfolio 
uh, guaranteed for the Small Business Administration could be deployed more or less instantly at an ad hoc opportunity. Remember, we have motive, opportunity, and weapon. And it's always puzzled me, or for a long time, but I think we now know the answer, how quickly these people could turn on a dime. That is to say, I don't think, I mean, the general idea of the attack on America, which was an attempted coup d'etat on 911, was formed. But essentially, they put the technologies together where they could take any aircraft within the general vicinity of the crime scene uh, up to an hour before impact. And the ATA companies and their mentors could go to an international online lending agency and say, well, uh, we need a million dollars or five million dollars to take this plane, let's say AA Flight 77, out of the air and crash it into the Pentagon's U.S. Navy Command Center, uh, in which case the lender would say, well, I need a guarantee before I lend it to you, clowns. So Christine Marcy pops in with her 60-minute guarantee program, and she goes to, I think they call it a surety company, which is uh, Wells Fargo, and says, we want you to guarantee the lenders that if the small business doesn't produce what it's supposed to do with its $5 million, you'll cover it. In which case, Wells Fargo, which was the master server on the Twin Towers, of course, says, okay, we'll do that. And then what Christine Marcy says to Wells Fargo is, however, under the rules of the Small Business Administration, uh, you get the right to claim from the government or the taxpayer the $5 million only after you have liquidated the assets of the small business, which borrowed the money. Now, liquidation is a funny term, depending on who you're talking to and who you're talking about. For the Clintons, liquidation means murder. Murder one at a distance because they've got the scum. But the fact remains is liquidation is liquidation. So it's liquidation of the 8 8 borrower and his family and his house, maybe under this backdoor mortgage scam that they've been talking about. Any patents that he has in his name or her name, it's basically you can, over a period of time, not just instantly necessarily, erase from history an individual, to a certain extent, the family around him. Witness JFK. A series of assassinations, intergenerational assass assassinations that hasn't removed the man's memory but it has removed his ability to discharge his oath of office with honor. And I believe JFK has that wonderful phrase, what we're dealing with is guerrillas by night and not armies by day. And soon after that speech, I think it was in Ireland, they decided he had to go. So it's 12.41, Phil, so we've run over a bit. What would you like to do now? We didn't really run over because we started late, but I'm ready to quit whenever you are. And in order to accommodate that, we need to go with Protocol 27 Charlie, uh, which means that someone named Mensa or one of the Dangerettes has to post the big red button or it could be a big green button. Um, and then after the button is presented, someone has to say three, two, one, push it, push it good or push it real good. And while we're waiting, you can have the last word, but uh, someone asked me about Emily Windsor, and my response uh, is that she's welcome amongst our group, but uh, she's not very good at getting over to England. I've been there four times since March, and I think I'm going again. I think I'll be leaving Wednesday the 29th of July, I hope to. Uh, there's a lot of things that could cause that not to happen, but uh, my not wanting to go or my being afraid to go is not one of those things. Uh, having said that, there's a movie producer from Buenos Aires uh, that is in communication with me, and there's also a Los Angeles movie executive producer that will be calling me later today. And if I were a Schiff or a Bush or a Clinton or a Rockefeller or Christine Marcy, uh, I would be grabbing my ankles and preparing for a ramming 
crew to arrive. David, over to you. Okay, thanks, Phil. So I put uh, an image of the USNO master clock, and I'm not putting you up against the wall, but do you remember what USNO stands for? Yeah, U.S. Naval Observatory. And isn't the, uh, there a house associated with the U.S. Naval Observatory occupied by some of the conspirators of 911? Yeah, Dick Cheney. He was the vice president. And my suggestion is it was his wife who was the conspirator. Well, she is a lesbian, just like Hillary and uh, Jamie Grelick, Janet Reno, Christine Marcy, uh, Elena Kagan, Sa uh, Sonia Santamoyo. All of these people are lesbians. And there's the 321. 